Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Union Endicott High School. Welcome to our first ever STEM night. My name is Luke Lipsu. I'll be your host this evening. And it is an absolute honor and privilege to be here tonight. I appreciate everybody that has come to show their support for our program. We have a packed schedule that I think you're really going to enjoy. So without further ado, I'd like to bring our first guest speaker of the night to the stage. He is a past teacher here at Union Endicott in the Engineering and Technology Department. He is the former president of the New York State STEM Education Collaborative and is currently serving as the co-chair for the 2023 STEM Education Institute held at Alfred State, Mr. Chuck O'Neill. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, in these uh, walls of the union that we got. Um, so I'm going to talk about what STEM is, uh, as far as I'm concerned and as far as the, uh, the New York State STEM Collaborative feels uh, what, what STEM is all about. <clears throat> what a great and important event for us to experience this evening that showcases the significant learning power and relevance of bringing together in a coordinated way, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, within our classrooms and learning spaces. It is, of course, essential to maintain the integrity of each STEM learning discipline, but equally important to incorporate creative ways to integrate these disciplines whenever possible and appropriate. Real-world problems are solved through utilizing combined knowledge is gained through math, science, technological, and engineering methods. <clears throat> if something is learned in one discipline, there are many opportunities in the other disciplines to utilize the same concept within a different context or format. These common experiences can strengthen the student's command of the concept and their ability to use it elsewhere. From the get-go, we can recognize well-known STEM fields of study that students can consider going into. These fields encompass engineering, science, mathematics, architecture, medical fields, dentistry, law, high-tech pursuits, and on and on. However, other fields of study need to be included also in this conversation. Um, like becoming a technician or a nurse, an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, a contractor, a machinist, an interior decorator, a mechanic, a loop, a pilot. Among the multitude of others, all of these fields require some command of integrated STEM skills. Preparing future workers, designers, innovators, engineers, and problem solvers of all ilks to know how to address and solve real world problems with essential integrative skills, with confidence, is the ultimate goal of STEM education. The world we live in, work in, play in, are all interconnected. When I refer to solving a real world problem, we can certainly agree that each problem can have multiple solutions. Let's see how many different mousetraps uh, can have, how many mousetraps uh, are, we have that are available. Oh, and yes, look at the multitude of different cars, trucks, boats, airplanes, motorcycles, and spacecraft that there are. Look at all of the subsystems built into these vehicles that may serve the same function but accomplish it in different ways. Hence, if we have five student teams working on a design problem, there will undoubtedly be no peaking five different outcomes. Let's take a brief look at how mathematics, science, technology, and engineering are defined. Mathematics is a science of numbers and shapes and what they mean. Mathematics is a form of communication that enables one to design, predict, monitor, and analyze processes. From the nano world to the living space to the astronomical world. Mathematics is everywhere. Everywhere we look, move, make, perceive, 
or playing an instrument or creating a work of art, you will find mathematics. Science is a field of study that seeks to understand the physical and natural worlds through observation, experimentation, and analysis. Technology and engineering is the heart of STEM, it's right in the middle. Hence, um, technology and engineering is the study of the human-made world. Hence, solving real problems, world problems, experiencing hands-on, minds-on activities, being immersed in project-based learning helps to define further the role of technology in engineering education. The roots and logic of integrated STEM problem solving began centuries ago, but only recently in 2001 was in this approach of connecting the four disciplines within an acronym. Uh, the first attempt was, was SMET, uh, which seemed quite harsh. Then later was softened by the National Science Foundation to become STEM. Of course, if a baseball fan might be involved uh, with the uh, naming of an acronym or what it's supposed to look like or read, then we might be talking about METS. However, assembling the four disciplines together into the acronym of STEM does not go far enough. Each discipline needs to integrate with the other disciplines whenever appropriate and possible. Granted, interdisciplinary connections do occur naturally in some courses, but it is truly possible to expand those all important connections more widely. The approach to STEM varies across the state and throughout the country. Some school districts might have identified just math and science uh, as a STEM program, or a STEM program with the letters combined, but without any vision to make those all important connections. Obviously, by making those connections, magnifies the relevance of learning and important linkages to the real world through each instructional discipline. The more relevance and interconnectedness that exists in classroom settings, the more students can become excited and engaged about what they are learning. Other problem-solving skills are usually important to experience and build upon, uh, including working and collaborating within a team and, not, and ongoing communication through practical representations, writing, speaking, and through digital means. STEM learning is true for all students presented in various and creative ways at all levels, kindergarten through graduate school. Imagine if all students, if all students were exposed to integrated STEM from an elementary through high school. By the time they reach high school, there would be no intimidation, discomfort, or not knowing where to begin to take on simple to complex real-world problems. Students would ultimately possess powerful, competent, creative, and innovative problem-solving skills. This, this country is in great need of a broader range of students who are inspired and comfortable going into STEM careers, which range literally in the thousands. In technology and engineering, I love the engineering design process of solving problems that can be utilized at all learning levels. Streamlined, of course, at the elementary level. To meet human needs and or the needs of our planet. Each discipline has its own method of solving problems. However, when you review the mathematical, scientific, technological, and engineering methods of solving problems, you can begin to recognize some commonality, or, again, interconnectedness. Through close examination, we can come to realize they are all related through common threads to each other. STEM learning also stresses the value of failure as a learning exercise. Failure is not an option, it can be our battle cry, but expect glitches or failures along that journey to fully, to fully operational reliable product. When we get a problem wrong, the next step is to seek out how to correctly solve it. I've had students working on solar electric vehicles, and sometimes they would find that they solve one problem and create two more. Failure happens all the time. Edison experienced over 2,000 failures before succeeding with the first functional light bulb. 
the WD-40 lubricant was preceded by 39 failures. Failure is a part of a process that ultimately leads to success. Hence, STEM learning plays a role with building a never-give-up approach via perseverance and a resilient work ethic. What does literacy mean? It means competence of knowledge in a specific area. So getting students to achieve mathematical, scientific, technological, and engineering literacy is a tall order, but it is an important, important goal to strive to accomplish. So what is STEM literacy? It is the ability to apply concepts from science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to solve problems that cannot be solved using a single discipline. In closing, STEM skills are becoming more essential no matter where one is working. It is a must to build critical thinking skills, diverse communication skills, teamwork, and collaboration, creativity, engineering design skills, and problem solving skills. They are the ticket for today's workforce all across the world. It is important that we strive to make those all important connections with our students. America has been the world's primary innovator for some time, and now could very well fall behind. The competitiveness of the U.S. economy depends on technological progress. STEM education is not a buzzword, but an absolute necessity for our communities, state, and nation to bring about a well-prepared, multi-skilled workforce. I'm very proud of Luke for organizing this informative and much-needed STEM-focused event, and all that is being done for STEM learning here at Union Etica. I applaud um, our math and science teachers for all that you do. I am astounded, astounded, and so very impressed with the UV Technology and Engineering Department's accomplishments with all that they are doing with their approach to STEM learning, and with such a diversified, exciting, and important project-based learning program. Project-based learning enables students to develop an all-encompassing activity from start to completion. The flight simulator you are about to see is an amazing accomplishment by Luke, developed over th a three-year period, and with the full support of the technology and engineering department as well, as from members of the greater Union Network community and beyond. Such a great example of what is possible by our students. And through the collaborative, collective effort of the Newton Endicott community, the simulator is a fabulous example of STEM learning in action. I encourage you all to stop down and take a look and see for yourself what is possible following this program. To all students here and everywhere, always believe in yourselves, never ever give up. We need you to become the problem solvers in America's future. I leave you with this stem enabling quote. If the human mind can conceive, then the human mind can achieve. Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, thank you again for being here. Our next speaker tonight is someone that I met a little over a month ago. I reached out to him, and immediately after our first meeting, I knew that he really put our community first, and that he was an incredible advocate for what we're doing here at the high school and for furthering their education. He's responsible for securing over $60 million in sponsorship for his programs. Please help me in welcoming Dean Sahari. Dean of the Watson School of Engineering and Applied Science, Binghamton University. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm Union Endicott High School. As someone who has lived in the Union Endicott School District for just around 30 plus years now, I am honored to have the opportunity to talk to all of you about STEM education, 
and what we can do. But first, I am really impressed by Luke and his introductory email to me as a pilot, as the journey he took, his service for our veterans, and if I may say so, at a relatively young age, compared to people like me, these people like Lou, who always renew my belief, my spirit for our nation. And the poor Ronald Reagan, who was here, who spoke at even in Indica almost three decades ago, it's always morning in America. And it's people like you who make that happen. Thank you very much. I would be remiss if I did not talk to you about Binghamton University. I have been at Binghamton since the fall of 88. My wife and I grew up from Virginia Tech, but I did my master's and PhD. And I started as an assistant professor in the Thomas J. Watson School of Engineering and Applied Science. Oftentimes, folks in our own campus don't realize that, for example, the Watson College, when you look at Times Higher Education, is one of the three accepted worldwide rankings. Our Watson College, which is less than 40 years old, your Watson College, is ranked 201 to 250 in engineering and a similar ranking for computer science. I won't go through all these, but our Binghamton University is the most selective in the SUNY system, and within Binghamton, the most selective programs are computer science and engineering, all in your own backyard. And for a university our size, a campus our size, not a university, a campus our size. We are 35th in the nation in public universities and 83rd in private universities. To put this in context, there are 64 SUNY campuses between the university centers, Binghamton, Albany, Stony Brook, and Buffalo. And looking at the four year colleges, the master's graduate institutions, the two year colleges, so the optometry, SID, and so on. With New York alone, with SUNY and CUNY. Then you've got California, which has two state systems. You have Texas, which has three state systems. Three three states alone have over 200 state campuses, and there are 47 other states. So being 35 is not too bad. And the SAT scores for the students who come in pre pandemic was to read 500 times in the country for the campus. And the people who beat us are Georgia Tech, actually Berkeley, Georgia Tech, UBA, William and Mary. So we are a pretty good company, and if you add one other constraint to US News, and if you say campuses with less than 25,000 students, guess who comes first? Binghamton University. So in your own backyard, we have a really juggle in the crown of the SUNY system and of our state. I will come to different examples of STEM in a couple of minutes. But the campus that we drive by on the Western Parkway are six colleges, the largest being Harvard College of Arts and Sciences and the five other colleges. And of course, my colleague Rihanna Testani is here with me today, and I both represent the Thomas K. Watson College of Engineering and Applied Science. We have a self-imposed limit on our undergraduate students. So depending on the year, we have something around 14,300 to 14,500 undergraduates and about 3,900 to 4,000 of our graduate students. And think about it. We have international students, Justin Watson, 
from 55 countries. The spirit of a university is to be able to get people from all corners of the globe, get the best and brightest, different ideas, different thought processes, people who can enhance the educational discourse on our campus, whether it was ancient Alexandria during Cleopatra's time, Aristotle's time later or Plato, or to go to my home, the country of my birth, India, which had universities 2,000 plus years ago, in Nalanda, or the state of my birth, I come from Tamil Nadu in southern India. Most of the history of Tamil Nadu at that time, 2,000 years ago, was written by Chinese travelers. So we always want our university, Bennington, to be a magnet to draw the best and brightest to enhance the academic discourse of the excellence. I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about Stan Bennington. Yes, he's a Nobel laureate. He's a fantastic researcher. He's an excellent academician. But for those of you who know Stan Whittingham, he's an excellent human being. A very down-to-earth, super humble gentleman who's always approachable, who's always looking out. And it's because of Stan that we have New Energy New York and battery manufacturing coming up in the Huron campus. So let's talk about STEM education. Why do we need STEM? I could spend a lot of time talking about it. I'm looking at the clock because I know Luke has a very good timeline that he would like for all of us to adhere to. I'm a faculty member. I can talk for a long time. <laughs> so when we talk about semiconductors, yes, this is super important for us as a nation. Whether we are in locking or BAE systems, whether in defense electronics, whether you are in consumer electronics, whether you have your iPhone, the wristwatch that I wear, the cars that you drive, all of them depend on semiconductors. All of them depend upon chips. And you'll be not surprised to know that Bennington University has got an excellent, it's one of the best in the country on electronics packaging, electronics manufacturing, or flexible electronics. We have a huge center here in building 256 and 257, which is probably the premier facility for road to road assembly. The best mines, some of the best mines in electronics manufacturing are five miles from here. Data science, AI, and robotics. This is definitely the technology of the future, the technology of today. And technology of the future. All of these, of course, are STEM based disciplines. Cyber security, something that in my lifetime they're never going to say, all right, that's not important anymore. We have a nationally recognized research center on our campus that focuses on cyber security, that is headed by Dr. Ping Yang and Dr. Yu Chen. Today, Dr. Yu Chen works specifically at Rome Labs at Griffiths Institute, about 120 miles northeast of here. Professor Jessica Friedman, who is probably the nation's leading expert on steganography, many, many years ago. And some of you in the crowd will not remember digital cameras. When we went from film to digital cameras, Jessica was the person who came by and said, this photograph was taken with this camera. An analogy would be that I'm a very non-violent person, but if you use a gun and you fire a bullet, you can trace it back to the specific firearm. Same thing. If you take a photo, she could trace it back, a digital photo, to the camera that it was taken from. And a very unfortunate topic that was used by the FBI to go after people who are doing bad things to young children. High performance computer. All of us do emails. I was working on some a little while ago. Many of us, not me, are on social media. 
we use from Google Maps to everything else, it's stored somewhere. Data center. So when we talk about massive data centers, think about the cooling of these data centers. It's an interdisciplinary problem. The range is from mechanical engineering to thermal modeling to looking at computer science and how do I actually use the data center. The objective being how do I cool the data center using the minimum amount of energy that can be expended to keep the data center running. So we have a national center on data centers. It's supported by about 15 different companies, ranging from Microsoft to Bloomberg to uh, Google and so on. All of those who are very interested, who are of course Meta, who have massive data centers of their own. Biotechnology. We have, for example, a fantastic relationship with Upstate Medical, where we are working on cutting edge bioprinting, regenerated manufacturing for human organs. That is the holy grail that we are after. We have faculty from Wellington working with medical experts at SUNY Upstate Medical who are doing things that five years from now. A goal, for example, I'm not, I hope they reach this, is to bioprint a pancreas. Think of the number of people who have got type 1 diabetes whom that will help. I could go on and on about things that we are doing in, in biomedical engineering. And we have got donors providing us with money for cancer research, for example. Individualized medicine based on your DNA. Folks working on 3D printing on, for example, of stuff that can be put inside your body, of variable electronics, and so on. When we talk about Bangalore University, we have got very strong teams working on solar, working on alternate energy. And there are many facets of alternate energy. We have got groups that are funded, for example, by GE Global Research, that are looking at, if I have a wind turbine and I'm storing energy, I have to store energy because when you have wind, you have energy. Wind may not work all the time. It may generate energy that's got to be stored. How do you model the, the, uh, the energy storage capacity? We have got folks who are working not only on lithium ion batteries that Stan Whitting and got his Nobel Prize for, people working on zinc based batteries. For our phone, a lithium ion battery is a very good idea. But for a large company, for a large facility, for a large warehouse, maybe you can use zinc based batteries. There are other options. There are more earth friendly, there are more earth abandoned. advanced materials. We have got folks working, for example, with our colleagues at BAE Systems on power electronics. Most of you know that BAE does a lot of controls, but you also probably see the BAE buses running around. And we have a very strong partnership with our colleagues just a couple of miles, maybe a mile from here. is when we talk about STEM in Watson, one it is transdisciplinary, we work with folks in physics, chemistry, math, management, social sciences, and social work. Some of the best work we do is with the Institute for Child Development, which is a superb facility in our own backyard, working with children with special needs, especially the autism spectrum. How do you use data science to help Professor Romanchuk, Professor Jennifer Gillis Baxter on assisting, evaluating, and helping children who have been diagnosed in the autism spectrum. How do we do? For example, uh, we have faculty like Professor Gretchen Mahler working on organ on a chip. We did talk about energy, we did talk about data centers. For example, I did mention the work with BAE on fast charging, 
on flexible electronics, variable electronics. For example, when does this matter? When we talk about And this does not put into the slide, but a new area, an emerging area, the internet of medical facts. When we have an aging demographic, America does. And one of the most traumatic decisions for people is to leave their home and go to assisted living. But if you were to bring assisted living to their house so that the person can have the can independence, can stay at home, but you can have non-contact measurement of critical parameters. And that is done today for pacemaker. There are, 10 years ago, I have seen non-confidential information, demos on non-contact measurement of, say, blood pressure, or beats per minute, or 120 by 80, diastolic and systolic. How do we collect the data and then only use data that is an exception. If things are going well, we don't want it now. But if it's beginning to trend in the wrong direction, we want it now. Autonomous systems. For the last 400 days, or approximately, there's been a war going on in Ukraine. So we look at drones. But let me tell you about Professor Jason Bogan who is funded very well to work on rules for agriculture to look at a combination of vision and deciding how much to use in terms of water, in terms of pesticide, and how we do this. Uncrewed vehicles can have excellent applications. Again, it goes back to our beginning in STEM. Uh, Professor Sandhu Cha works on what we call drone truck optimization. Imagine this, you have a, a, UH, a UPS truck driving down the road and has got drones from it delivering packages to your house. The truck is moving, the drone is moving, it comes back to the other truck, gets the next package on the multiple drones. How do you program that? How do you do path planning for that? How do you optimize that? This can also be used for Disaster management. We hopefully should never have one when we have, say, an Hurricane Katrina, which was a mega disaster for us as a nation. How do we provide almost instantly, immediately, through 24 hours, relief to people through mechanisms such as drones? Today's students are not like me. I came to Binghamton, like I said, in 88. In a couple of months, it will be 35 years that my wife and I grow a meter four rest car up 81. Today's students are entrepreneurial. They want to start their own companies. And we would not be doing the right thing for our customer, our student is both our customer and our product. We would not be doing the right thing for our students if we didn't have the ability for them to have a pre-incubator incubator, which is what the Cochrane Inter Incubator is in downtown Bangalore. And it's open to our students, our faculty, our staff, and folks from our community. And it's super successful. I will stop here now. I can give you a lot more examples. But in the interest of time, and I will be around if you have any questions. Uh, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much for your attention. STEM cannot be more important. And for the balance in the room, at the Indian University, the highest median salary is for folks from Watson. Five, six years ago, it used to be the School of Management. Not anymore. For the last few years, if I talk about our students being our customer and our product, I told you we get excellent students. If our students cannot get placement, something that we are doing is wrong. And we, we try to make sure that from year, day one, they have folks working with them on their resume, on job panels, on internships, mock uh, interviews. We do a whole range of things. 
to make sure that our students develop a portfolio that makes them marketable, get a job, help us in the great state of New York, and of course, help this nation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Dean Sarhara, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight. Our final speakers for this evening are two engineers from one of the largest employers in our area. They are from Lockheed Martin. Please help me in welcoming Jillian Catalani and Cassandra. Twice, but now I specialize in it, so it's all right. If you fail once, you can't succeed. 
see, right? Also, communication, in my opinion, is the most important skill to bridge any technical ability. Because you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you're not able to articulate the message and get aligned from other people, it's all for not. So personal qualities, again, integrity, that goes back to my roots. Also, being in the service, also Lockheed values it very much so. So what does that mean to you, right? We all say it's doing the right thing when no one's looking, and that's applied everywhere, at home, at work, at school, right? Critical thinking skills, thinking outside the box. The scariest thing that we hear at Lockheed is like, well, we've always done it the same way. We've been doing this for 30 years. That's not the mentality that we need to move forward. Also, how do we manage resources? You can be held accountable for what you do and do not do with respect to time. Sometimes there's no second chances. So you have to understand and make those risk-based decisions. Also, in our personal qualities, team is everything. Building those relationships with the people, um, teaching others what you know. Don't hold all the cookies. I always say that, right? Teach others what you know to make those better and your team better as well. Leadership opportunities are also given every day. You don't have to have a manager your name to be a leader, and um, <clears throat> that means that you don't have to be a team captain or a manager. Some of the best leaders don't have that in their name. Also, how is technology used in my occupation? Again, computers are everywhere. You don't like being on a computer? You might as well get used to it. Back no phone in regards to that. And also, nothing is on paper anymore. Every company is going green. We have digital transformation projects across the company. Um, we also have one LMX. It's a corporate-wide company or company-wide uh, mission to become all inclusive and doing things simpler and better, more streamlined with regards to digital transformation. And lastly, here there's a couple footnotes. Passion, motivation equals success. No matter what you do, if you're passionate about something, and you're motivated by doing it, you're going to be successful. I don't care if you want to be a dog groomer, an art teacher, uh, a professor, a doctor. Again, if you're passionate and motivated, you will be successful. And again, our three Lockheed Martin, Martin core values is do what's right, respect others, and perform with excellence. That's just not a company, a company slogan. I think that everyone can take away from that and use it in their day to day life. Right, so I'm just going to do a quick coverage of like the Omega site. Um, we are out in the Omega, New York, just like. 15 minutes, 10 miles is my normal morning, morning commute. I live just down the street. Um, pretty big campus. You can see that overhead aerial shot where we have our different buildings where we do some different manufacturing. We have a couple of different uh, hangars for our helicopters, which you've probably heard overhead or seen at some point. I'll cover this a little later too. Um, customer base is very broad. It's mostly military. We do have some commercial customers as well, where I think it was the Army is our biggest customer, and then uh, various other fields. And then we'll also do some foreign military sales. So again, everything we've been talking about, being the engineering, science, technology, engineering, math, we have come up with a lot of different products. This is like a very skimming the surface type of overview of what we do and what we work on within Lockheed Martin and even just within the Omega plant. There's a lot of different lines that we work on. So up on the top left, sorry, <laughs> um, we have our different product lines of boxes. And we'll, when we say we build a box, we are designing the cards that go into the box, we're designing the physical box itself, and then we're also making sure it will be able to communicate with other boxes in any aircraft that we are designing. So that is a very uh, a lot of overlap with different engineering disciplines because we'll have the electrical engineers going through and designing the cards, making sure we're going to be able to support the power, we're going to be able to support any processing. The mechanical engineer will come in to make sure it all fits into the box, design the heat transfer to make sure that we're not overheating any of the cards and that they'll be able to meet all their customer requirements because their military applications will have to be super rugged. Um, software and firmware engineers come into play to make sure that the processors can actually talk to each other because they write on level of code um, to make them do what they need to do. Um, then we also have off the side is some different ones. So we, in the Amigo site, have been supporting Postal for many years, which was helping sort all those letters that USPS gets um, to make sure that they all can read the different addresses and get sorted correctly. Then there's also different laser systems, so we're doing directed energy, which is just a little bit 
there's less needed. You don't need the ammo, you don't need materials necessarily there. You need just energy behind it. And you can still make attacks. And then various platforms strung across here on the bottom. So will it be anywhere from sea, land, air? Um, just a little bit of our key market segments. Within the uh, RMS and supported at the Vigo site, we have IWSS integrated warfare systems and sensors. So that's a lot of the mission processing. So we're doing a lot of computers, uh, making sure that they work and talk with one another. Uh, electronic warfare, so that's getting in with our radars to make sure we can detect the enemy before they detect us or confound the enemy so they are not able to spot us. Um, the laser systems and the sensors. And then we also have Sikorsky line of business, and that's where uh, those two helicopters I mentioned before, where we have the MH60, our naval helicopter program, which we receive from our other sites, and then we put in all of those different components and we do the integration testing and then that's when they go out and fly to make sure it's going to meet all the customer needs. And then we also have the VH-92, which is the presidential helicopter. So if you ever see the green one or you see the president land on the lawn, that helicopter is probably built here and integrated here. Um, then we also have this combat rescue helicopter, which is used in a lot of different applications to rescue people from various situations. And then there's also the training logistic solutions, which similar to the flight simulator Luke has built, we do a lot of different training for our pilots to make sure that they can get through their different situations in a safe environment. All right, then here lastly is uh, CSXI FR, which I'm directly responsible from a quality standpoint. We have a facility here in Oviedo, and then we also have a major facility also in Syracuse, where we work uh, cohesively to work on projects with regards to communications, computers, uh, cybersecurity, and intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance, as well as the majority of our product line deal with countermeasures to ensure that the warfighter comes home safely with regards to threat detection. All right, for manufacturing here at Lego. So if you look at the, at the 12 o'clock dot here, that's a unpopulated PWB or printed wire board. They literally start with a piece of material that's the size of a piece of paper. And it's still magic to me how PWBs are made. So there's so many uh, chemical engineering disciplines, process engineering disciplines, material engineering that go into making these. And then if you go again to the two o'clock, it goes straight into a circuit card where we populate those components, resistors, et cetera, and so forth. And then, like Asana had mentioned, we make boxes, right? So again, these are unique. Sometimes they are uh, mission computers, flight computers. Uh, <clears throat> radar assemblies, radar, excuse me, receivers, transmitters, and then it also, you can see the interior of that box, and then how they all speak together as well. We have many labs, I think probably over 50 labs um, in Amigo, that specifically their test component is at the system level, as well as software um, engineering labs as well. Again, we make uh, composite fabrication, as well as our machining, Area at Lockheed Martin is, and we go, is the center of excellence for all of RMS. So, across the RMS line of business for Lockheed Martin here at WeGo, our machining center uh, is world class. So, we went from probably a four or five machine center to now we have 40 machines. So, it's, it's really something out there. And again, we do rack and uh, fabrication population as well. The picture in the middle that you see is the Romeo or the Seahawk hangar there, and it is a world-class facility for sure. We also have an RF chamber that we do a lot of our radar testing in. It's uh, pretty neat. Some of the students that maybe are in this audience tonight have been in there. It's, uh, it's a really cool experience to go in there and uh, take a tour. And if you do get the chance to, definitely have the opportunity to check that out. Again, Lockheed Martin, we're a huge into the community. I'm part of Mill Vets, which is a uh, diversity and inclusion. <coughs> Group that we have. There's many diversity inclusion groups. I know Cassandra is part of our PAN diversity inclusion group as well. And then I also am part of engineering in the classroom group. And again, we also do other community projects, not the highway, we support Open Door Mission, also the Binghamton Air Show. We probably also maybe possibly been to a hockey game where we sponsor some events and uh, Twin Tiers Honor Flight. So Twin Tiers Honor Flight, if you don't know anything about Honor Flight, <laughs> they take veterans and they give them a chance to go to Washington, D.C. on a two-day trip to see the different memorials, et cetera, and so forth. And me being a veteran and also 
Um, I was able to represent Lockheed Martin and um, go up there as part of the staff as an all, women, all women's uh, honor flight. And that was the first time that they've done it. There's only been three other honor flights in the uh, in the nation, so that was pretty outstanding that Lockheed uh, bridges that uh, community ties as well. It's, it's very important, just like what we're doing here tonight, because you guys are the future of, of this country, and also we, we are uh, dependent on your minds lead us into the, into the future as well. We are dreamers. We jump a little too high for the comfort of our mothers. Like to keep our heads in the clouds and stay up too late building our toys. Sure, we may be a little different from the rest, but we like it that way. It's what makes us unique because it takes a courageous person to turn dreams into reality. The more we dream, we dream big. No other company in the world has the opportunity and the ability to create the dreams of today for a better tomorrow. Our mission is not for the faint of heart because our calling is to take the impossible and to make it possible. These innovations are making a difference in our world and well beyond. As leaders in the industry, we are setting the standard for excellence. Where there is often little to no room for errors, our legacy has been a part of writing global history, and one can only imagine what we will create next. So we are a little different than the rest, and we like it that way. It's what sets us apart to create, build, and advance our legacy far into the future. The best is yet to come, and we can't wait to see what these visionaries will do next. And with that, I think that's a great segue to bring uh, Luke back and to see his vision. Thank you both again so much for being here tonight. One of the things I love about this evening, about this event, one of the reasons I did it, uh, is because in just a matter of about 50 minutes, we were able to hear from people that influence kids in STEM, the high school level, the collegiate level, and the real life application and career path. I'm passionate about that high school level because it's our job as students to inspire our classmates, as educators to inspire their students, and as colleagues to inspire our colleagues to get into STEM and to continue that, that passion. So right now I'd like to welcome a few teachers up to the stage that have been part of a project that's been referenced a few times this evening, and that is the Union of the Cats Flight Simulator. So please, Mr. Tom Palazzo, Mike Wachowski, and Corey Munn, if you can come up to the stage. As they make their way up, they a little bit about what we did. So three years ago, we started a massive project to build a full immersion flight simulator in the school that would serve all of the kids um, that go here for generations to come. I approached my teachers, who might have been a little optimistic, and they fully supported me. So I'd like to thank all of you for believing in me and believing in what we, what we do here at Union Anacots, uh, because without them, there are many kids that probably wouldn't achieve what they will in their lives. <laughs> a little shorter. I've only been given four minutes, and one thing I've learned through this project is Luke's timeline is rock solid. So, Luke. 
I hope we don't go for four minutes. All right. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tom Palazzo. I'm a technology teacher here. I've spent my entire life in the school system. Um, I was inspired to be a tech teacher by Chuck Goodwin, who was the first speaker. That says everything about this program, that we're inspiring the future to go down the, the MST, the um, whatever acronym we want to use, um, math, science, technology route. Um, our program here is, is very well in tune with that and, and uh, motivating students to go on to do great things. Okay, over the past 32 years I've been in here and I've noticed, I, I've witnessed many projects. The solar car, many solar cars. We won the Tour de Sol in 2003. Electrophone cars, veggie oil cars, and now flight simulator. Yeah, that was a lot of cars. I was knee deep in motor oil when I first took Chuck Goodwin's class and I realized there was something better, something brighter in the future. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone that's contributed to Luke's project, um, but I can't list it so big, right? Um, I'd like to acknowledge UE Tech Club, who over the past three years has cycled in and out with many different members, all who have had hands on this project. Kevin Cerruti came in, who's a, um, a local guy that made simulators. Um, BAE, who let us come in and, and take a look at all, all of their simulators and see how they work. So we had lots of questions. Matter of fact, one day, when we were deciding we were going to BAE, Luke called and said, I got an idea. Before we go to the flight simulator, um, you want to go for a flight? And I said, uh, you sure? <laughs> um, I mean, most teachers wouldn't allow their students to drive them in a car, all right? Um, but there I was on the runway about a half hour later, and I, I was ready, okay? It was, it, was, it was quite a flight. Very good pilot. Um, Lockheed Martin has helped us out on this. Tanks auto sales. We needed someone to tow an airplane down I-81 after Luke found it in his, his flights across New York State and found a crashed airplane. That's where we came off this day. Um, Good Earth Aviation. Escape Aviation. And thanks to generous donors. There's so many donors of the community that have donated and said, we don't want to be mentioned, but thank you. I would like to acknowledge Luke Lipsu for his accomplishment with the construction of the flight simulator. He is truly a student that has a vision, set a goal, and has the drive to get there. This project is an example of what we can accomplish when the whole community comes together. To support the students. Projects like this are extremely, extremely valuable to the students. They use math, science, and apply real world problem solving through engineering. <coughs> Finally, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to show your support for us. We appreciate it. Seconds, so I'm gonna uh, hit. Um, again, thank you for all for coming tonight. Thank you, Tom. Uh, my name is Mike Kuchowski. I'm one of the technology and engineering teachers here uh, at the high school as well. Uh, we would also like to take this opportunity uh, to thank those in the district who have uh, really supported us through the success of this project. Uh, the Union Cap Board of uh, Education, uh, the leadership and administration uh, at both our district and our building levels, uh, Post Computer Services, 
uh, and the union have got building the ground staff as well. Uh, not for your support uh, for our department and our programs. Uh, we would not be able to provide opportunities for students like Luke uh, to be able to showcase their passions and provide really educational opportunities uh, for other students for many years. Thank you again, Paul. I also have 30 seconds. Um, I teach a handful of engineering uh, classes here. My name's Corey Vaughn. Uh, every year I start out in, with a uh, parent advisory council meeting and try to recruit new parents to kind of support the program. And every year I start out by saying we have the best technology program in the state. Uh, we offer more classes than most other schools between the tech classes and engineering classes. And it's all made possible through the support of the community. Um, parents, the administration, pretty much they foster and care and uh, promote every wild and crazy idea that they have. Um, just in the last five years, I think we've had about four classes um, purchased thousands of dollars of uh, equipment to help parents have education for our students. So thank you all very much. We've heard a lot about it, we've talked about it, but we compressed a three-year story into a 13-minute short film. So it's a great pride and privilege to be able to present this documentary that we created for you. Okay. Hello, my name is New York. It's a small community nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It's home of the Unidentica Tigers and fits the stereotype of what you'd expect to find in small town America. The head of the meat in the old abandoned buildings sits a rich history of flight that oftentimes people my age may forget. So how do you inspire the next generation of STEM professionals and aviators? Let me show you. For the troops, and I was accomplishing big things at a young age. Hi, my name is Luke Clipsu. I'm a pilot, YouTuber, and entrepreneur. At 15, I took my first flight in an airplane, sold for the first time on my 16th birthday, and then a year later became a private pilot on my 17th birthday. Hello, my name is Tom Plaza. I've been a technology education teacher here at Union Undercut High School for 21 years. I've been a Volunteer firefighters at Edwall for the past 21. My name is Jeff. I'm a technology and engineering teacher here at Union High School. In 2023, I was accepted into the New York State National Teacher Program as well as selected as the Region 43 Teacher of the Year. This story really begins with a vision. A vision to inspire other kids and give back to a community that's given so much to me. Ever since I found my passion for flying, I've made it my mission to spread that love to as many other people as possible and to use it as a tool to make the world a better place. When Luke was in my class in 2020, he uh, kept eyeing the door in the back of my room that was marked flight deck door authorized personnel only. He asked me what was that about, and I, I said I had a tech club that a few years back started uh, a flight simulator project, and it was nothing but a, a single projector on the wall with a couple of flight controls and a plywood screen that we made that kind of wrapped around where he'd sit at a desk. A flight simulator. That was it. This was the way that I was going to inspire other kids in my school to learn how to fly. So he offered to clean my closet and threw out tons of junk and old old stored materials 
and started building a flight simulator. I think when I first brought this idea up, people were probably pretty skeptical on if this really would become a reality. Being the second time that we attempted this project, I was pretty skeptical that a single student could do this project. They didn't want it to just be the same thing over again. Luke assured me that he would make it a flight simulator like nothing I had ever seen before, and it would be a fully immersive flight simulator. So he seemed pretty motivated, so I gave him a shot. Once the vision was set, and we were given the go-ahead to turn this old, empty closet into a full immersion flight simulator, we were off to the races. The Human Tech Club raised over $7,000 in monetary donations in the following months, and also another $8,000 in company sponsorships. In addition to all of that, we got donated a full frame of an old Piper Cherokee that has since retired. More to come on that later. The first step that we took to making this room a friendly space for a flight simulator was to make it an actual room and not a closet. We carpeted the whole thing and painted the walls and ceiling black to eliminate any glare that the projectors would make for a 180 degree screen. We built this in four different sections and place them in the room individually and then assemble them once they were all in place. So Luke approached me um, about making this 180 degree screen um, and he kind of knowing that my specialty and kind of passion would work. He wanted to make sure that we could model this thing. Uh, again, in our 3D modeling software, I'll make sure it was actually going to be feasible. This is nothing I had ever had tried to build in the past or ever tried we ever been asked to make, uh, so it was, it was a learning experience for all of us. This happened all during COVID, while the world shut down, lumber prices skyrocketed severely. Uh, even the availability of some, some of the material it was hard to get. Once the screen was built, we realized that MDF really didn't look too good on projectors. For that reason, we primed it and sanded it multiple times to get rid of all the blemishes that were in the material. After that, we painted the screen with a 4K paint that makes it the ideal surface for a projector picture. This allows us to run the screen at 4K for videos, and we normally run the simulator software at 1080p, which runs absolutely amazing. The alternative was buying a $10,000 screen, which was feasibly not really where we wanted to be. Uh, and we were able to complete the project for about five hundred dollars. Once the screen was complete, we moved on to another one of the daunting tasks of this project and built a custom projector mount to hold two projectors from the ceiling so that they wouldn't move and that they hold in place perfectly 24-7, 365. In order to do this, we fabricated a custom metal frame in our metal shop that fit perfectly for the dimensions of the room, which is a little funky and isn't a perfect rectangle. This is something that we didn't figure out until this point. Take me away to real close. I want to drive on your open road like the wilderness. We are born to walk. Once the projectors were up, we connected it to a temporary computer in the room that would eventually turn into the main flight simulator computer. We run a program that's called Fly Elise Immersive Display Pro. This allows us to take two messed up, unworked projector images and make it so it fits perfectly on our curved screen. Of course, this is required because it isn't a perfect flat rectangle, and this was another difficult task. We spent weeks on weeks trying to figure out the best way to do this, and we ended up figuring it out in the once the projectors were worked, we called it a year and wrapped things up for the 2022 school year. This was now year two of the project, and we were anxious to get it done. Unfortunately, due to asbestos removal in our building, we were unable to come into work all of July and August, so we had to push it back and only wait for September when we came back to school. This was now my senior year of high school, which was going to be filled along with all of the crew that was working on this project. So when you add those three schedules together, it made it really difficult to get a lot done quickly. When we came back in September, we got started right away, and we first started with our airplane that was sitting out behind the school. This was a 1984 Piper Cherokee that had previously crashed, nobody got hurt, and that was donated to the UE Tech Club for this project. It was a way for the flight school that donated it, which is 747 Aviation in Portland, New York, to fly again. 
We started by chopping the airplane in half. Once we added the shady line, we had to gut the entire thing because, unfortunately, the things that were made in the 80s aren't really up to our standard in 2023. After the cockpit was formed and we had the piece that we were going to put in the room, we then realized that we had to chop that in half yet again because it wouldn't fit through the door. And unfortunately, we couldn't cut through the concrete wall into the center. Once we did that, we cut through it horizontally and brought the cockpit in in two pieces. We reassembled it in the room and got to work on a custom panel, custom interior, and installing all the avionics and electronics into the cockpit. After another couple months of all of that happening, we finally had what looked like an airplane. The only thing we had to do now was to get all of the computer set up with all of the new electronics that we had installed, including the Garmin G1000 from Real here and all of the flight controls from Honeycomb Aeronautics. This became a really cool part of the project because it finally started to come together. We fired up X-11 for the first time, and after figuring out a few minor glitches, we got it to work perfectly, and we took our first flight. Now it's time 
if you'd like to go apply that piece of technology, see what it's about, and enjoy some refreshments, maybe ask some questions if you have any, and we'd love to have you downstairs. There are signs outside that guide you down to the uh, labs. It would be a little confusing. So thank you again so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you.